Okay, I guess we're live. So um, uh, I'm George Giddis. I'm going to be uh, giving a webinar. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Center for Rare Diseases for inviting me to do so. Thank everybody for tuning in. Um, it's, a, it's a little weird, but they asked me to introduce myself, which I haven't done in quite a while. So, um, so my name is George Giddis. I'm a uh, uh, pediatric surgeon here at Children's Hospital. Um, I'm the chief of pediatric surgery. I'm a professor of pediatrics and um, surgery uh, at the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And um, the, the, the professorship is an endowed chair under the name of Benjamin Fisher Chair. I am the uh, director of a, a research institute here at Children's called the RK Mellon Institute for Pediatric Research. And I'm the surgeon in chief emeritus of the hospital. Um, so today's topic is um, it's kind of two topics, but they're, they're all sort of three topics, really. So it's gene therapy for diabetes, of which there are two subtopics, and then um, chemical pancreatectomy, which isn't really a thing, but we're, but we're gonna make it a thing, uh, to treat chronic pancreatitis, which also is related to diabetes. Um, I do have uh, two uh, disclosures um, related to a gene therapy company called Genfrax based in uh, Texas that has uh, licensed the gene therapy know-how for the, for the first part of the talk, not the second part of the gene therapy, uh, and I'm on their scientific advisory board. Um, anyway, so, so these three topics, the first is gene therapy as it relates to turning non-insulin cells into insulin cells as a way to treat diabetes, mellitus specifically, and um, that's pretty much applicable to both types one and two, and um, the second kind of gene therapy strategy that I'll talk about is more for type one or juvenile autoimmune diabetes, which is uh, to, to alter some of the cells that are particularly uh, um, important in terms of mediating the autoimmune attack on these insulin cells and leading to this juvenile form of uh, type 1 diabetes. And then the last topic is this, this thing I alluded to. I put in quotes because it really is, it's not really a word yet, but hopefully it will become one. Chemical pancreatectomy in order to prevent or treat chronic pancreatitis and the diabetes associated with it, as well as, as, well as other complications. Um, Okay, so well, I mentioned diabetes several times now. So uh, really what diabetes essentially is in this case is a disease uh, due to insufficiency of insulin. And, um, and then the lack of that leads to this toxic rise in blood sugar as well as other uh, metabolic uh, disruptions that are all toxic. But the one we always think about is, is the blood sugar. Anyway, so, so the, I mentioned type one and type two. So type one or, di or juvenile um, is the autoimmune one where the body's immune system mistakenly attacks these insulin cells and kills them. And uh, about one and a half million people in the US have this um, disease and the, and the incidence and prevalence is rising, unfortunately. Um, but then uh, type two is much more common. And it's a little more complicated in the sense that uh, it's associated frequently, not always frequently associated with diet. And um, these patients uh, develop what's called an insulin resistance. They're, despite the fact they're making insulin to lower their blood sugar, it doesn't work very well in, this, in their tissues. It's often associated with obesity. But there's a lot of people who are obese or have other risk factors for this and um, do have some degree of insulin resistance, but their pancreas is fine with it. It just makes more insulin, and overcomes it, and they're fine. Um, but it's not really clear who, why some people get this diabetes in the same setting of insulin resistance and some don't. There's about, it's, a, it's very common. So roughly 35 million people in the United States have this. There's something like another 30 or 40 million that have what's called pre-diabetes, or the kind of, if you study them more closely, they're kind of on their way to, to having type 2 diabetes. So it's extremely prevalent. And you know, the overall estimate is probably upwards of over 400 million people in the, United, in the world, rather, that have some form of diabetes. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Not, and you know, it's, you know, here I am presenting at the rare diseases uh, uh, webinar, obviously not rare diseases, but um, either way, it's, I think it's a, a good topic. So um, type two has had a lot of uh, interesting new developments in terms of therapy, but there really has been nothing for type one besides insulin, which came out in 1919, was in, started to be given in 1920. But since then, there's, you know, there's been pumps and different ways of monitoring all that, but no real new treatment uh, since then. So hopefully we can change that. All right, uh, so first topic I alluded to was this gene therapy to induce uh, these new insulin cells to form in the pancreas in patients with either type one or type two diabetes. Um, and and uh, basically what we're doing is manipulating the pancreas. So, so I'd like to start with this historical example. So the pancreas does have some ability to change itself significantly. So what I call changeability, or the more biomedical term is plasticity, the ability to change. And um, this is a, what you're seeing on the screen here is a normal hamster pancreas, and it's being take, taken out and it's put on a, a dish. And uh, this is how it looks. 
Um, but oh gosh, back in the 50s, I think they developed a technique where, I don't know who came up with this, but they, they decided to deprive the, the hamster of copper in their diet. And they did that and would cause this inflammation of their pancreas and they'd be a little bit sick. And then they would, um, but then what was interesting and what they're showing in this paper from the 80s was that when they gave them the copper back in their diet after six to eight weeks, this pancreas looked like this. And what you're seeing is um, a complete conversion of this pancreas, not complete, but almost complete conversion to uh, liver. And um, here, what, the, what I'm showing, you can see my laser pointer here, but basically you've got these, I here stands for islet, which is the hormone cells. It's called the islet because it's like a little island inside the pancreas of hormone cells. The pancreas is about 99% made up of these, these cells down here normally. They're called acinar cells. They, they make the digestive juices that help you digest your food. Um, and that's, again, about 99% of the pancreas. The other 1% or maybe 2% is these hormone cells, of which many are insulin cells. But in this hamster, all of that's gone, and we've got a bunch of this, of this stuff, which is all liver. And um, you know, I just show this to kind of emphasize the, the ability of the pancreas to be changed. And we certainly are harnessing that um, in our work uh, for, with G-therapy. OK, so um, I mentioned how the juices of the pancreas come out of the pancreas and go into the intestine to help, them digest, help us digest food. So that there has to be a way for the juices to get from the pancreas into the intestine, and that, that is called a little tuber duct that leads from the pancreas into the intestine, and there's a little opening in the intestine that um, is where the, all the juices come out and pour into the intestine to help digest the food. So that, but we can take advantage of that opening by finding it and then, and then infusing or squirting stuff upstream into it to go all, all out to the pancreas and in this way deliver gene therapy or whatever it might be uh, to the pancreas uh, by that method. Now, in, in, as I'm gonna talk about in mice and in monkeys, they are they're pretty small, so in order to get access to that little opening in the intestine, we have to do surgery on them, like it's shown here with this mouse. But in humans, you don't have to. So there's a procedure that's commonly done every day, really, um, in humans uh, that uh, goes through the mouth, and they go down and find this opening downstream in the intestine, and they can squirt stuff up, upstream into it of an ERCP or endoscopic retrograde cholangy pancreatography. Anyway, it's, it's very uh, very likely that if we do develop a technique here that's translatable to humans, it's gonna be through that methodology. Anyway, so we worked it out in mice, and here's the infusion system, and uh, allowed us to infuse uh, things in there. And in, in the first topic here, so we're talking about infusing a virus that carries two genes that we think are helpful for not only making new insulin cells like in an embryo or in a fetus, but also in, in how that insulin cell functions to make and, and release insulin. The two genes are called PDX1 and MAFA, and for the purpose of this talk, I'll just abbreviate it as PM. And the virus, so most gene therapy generally is through using a virus. And viruses are, you know, have been around for, you know, eons, and uh, it's nature's way of getting genes into cells uh, that can cause disease or not. But in this case, we can, use, we can harness them to, 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 to deliver genes that we want to get into cells. Um, this, this particular virus is called adeno-associated virus, AAV, um, which is probably the most common form of gene therapy virus. Uh, most gene therapy in general is a virus. There are some that aren't, but of those that are viruses, most of them are AAV. So this is nothing unique here. So anyway, so we, we decided to, to use these two genes, infuse them into the pancreas, as I described. And what we did was we took a mouse, this is a, the blood sugar in the y-axis here, and normal is about, you know, in the low hundreds or something. And we give them a drug called here called Eloxan. And Eloxan kills off the insulin cells. And then they become diabetic. And here's their, their blood sugar goes way up. And then we infuse either an empty virus, which is this one here, AAV8 GFP. So GFP stands for green fluorescent peptide. Just a way that we know that the fluorescent green shows that the virus got into the cell, but there's nothing in the virus. Whereas the one that we like, that's PM one I was talking about, brings their blood sugar down fairly quickly after about a week or two. Uh, and then just stays normal the rest of the life. And then when we look at the number of insulin cells in the animal, so yellow is a normal animal that's been untouched. Red is when we just give them that drug and, and then they give them this empty virus. So they really have very, very few of the insulin cells and way down here. But then uh, within four weeks when we harvested them, uh, if we give them this good virus, the PM virus, they've regained about 60% of their insulin cells, which was to us was pretty amazing actually. Uh, within that short period to get regain that many insulin cells. So the big question was, well, first of all, where do they come from? And um, it turns out they come from another hormone cell that's not killed by the drug. 
And in this case, it's called a glucon cell or alpha cell. So you have alpha cells and beta cells. Alpha is this one hormone, glucon, and beta is the insulin cell. And what we did is what's called a lineage tag, which means you basically, you take a, you take a glucagon cell or an alpha cell, you label it genetically with a, with a tomato red dye. And that, by genetically labeling a cell, that means if it, if it once it's labeled, it's, no matter what it does after that, it's going to stay red. Even if it divides and makes more cells, they're all going to be red. So what you're seeing here on the left, these are the same, these are the same, uh, same section of tissue. One is looking at the red and one is looking at blue for insulin. So you're seeing a bunch of cells here that are red, but not blue. Those are glucon cells, they're alpha cells. They're, they're just make, still making glucon, nothing's happened. But, and, but, these, but because of the virus, a lot of these red cells are also blue. Both these and that's because the glucagon cells, at the time the label turned on, they became red. But then when we did the virus, they turned into insulin cells and they started making insulin. And in this setting, they turned blue. So they're both red and blue. And therefore, new insulin cells have come from these glucagon cells or alpha cells. And that was pretty much proof positive. Very convincing to us. All right. So um, what about juvenile diabetes? So we gave a drug to these mice to, to kill their insulin cells. So that's, that's not that's not autoimmune. It may be in some way more like type two, but either way, uh, it's not type one. It's not autoimmune. So um, what what there is a model is this non-obese diabetic mouse, NOD, NOD mouse, that is extremely similar to human uh, autoimmune or juvenile diabetes, type one diabetes. And we decided to try it in these mice with the idea that, well, maybe that'll help them, but in theory, it shouldn't work at all because the same reason that the mouse or a human kills off their own insulin cells making new insulin cells as i've described from these glucagon cells so what you know the body's just going to say well yeah we know how to kill those we're going to kill those too um but you know we're, we're a, i'm a surgeon and surgeons try things so we just tried it anyway of course it worked um so here's the here's a, a similar graph as the earlier one except different in the way that these mice get start their blood sugar starts going up on their own they start getting their own di normally start killing their own insulin cells and start having diabetes so at the time when it started to go off you can see right about here we infused either that empty virus again, the GFP, or the good virus. You can see if you infuse the empty virus, their blood sugar just keeps going up very rapidly and they, they, they die, essentially. Uh, whereas, uh, what we sacrificing? But um, whereas with the other one, they go down with a, within about two to three weeks, they're back to normal and they stay that way for four months, despite them having autoimmune attack potentially on their insulin cells. So that was, I would say, very exciting. That's just pretty exciting. Um, but it lasted four weeks, but from uh, just after one infusion. So um, uh, the number of cells uh, was recovered to not quite as well as with the previous one, where you had 60 percent. This is more, probably more like 30 percent of the insulin cells are recovered, but still pretty good. Um, this graph is a little deceptive because it's got a bar through it, so the scale is different between the lower half and the upper half. So it's, there's a ton more insulin cells in these in the PM treated versus the empty virus treated. So that gave us some, some enthusiasm about uh, potentially translating this to humans for, for juvenile diabetes. Anyway, but um, we, for humans, we want to say, well, would this, this, I mean, that's great in mice, but would this even work in humans? So what we did is we were able to get access to some of these human tissues, that, that these hormone cells from human tissues from a cadaver from the pancreas. And we, we took those tissues, the islets, and we killed the insulin cells and then treated them with this virus in a petri dish. And then put those cells, those islets, into an, an, a mouse to see how they grew. And uh, on the left is what they look like with the empty virus. You can see there's a lot of these red cells, these glucon cells or alpha cells. There's a few green insulin cells, but they're probably ones that were left over because we didn't quite kill all the insulin cells when we gave this uh, drug. But then over on the right is when we gave the good virus. You can see lots of new insulin cells have formed. And to prove that they really work well, we did this in a mouse. We put it in a mouse kidney where these mice don't don't reject like a you know like a transplant they don't reject the human tissues and um but they were diabetic these mice and we showed that this, these islets these human tissues were able to re reverse their diabetes so they work not only their the insulin in them but they also work well in terms of you know, controlling diabetes there so so kind of proof of principle that uh that they survive and that we can do it in humans but um the real the real big question is why aren't they attacked why aren't they killed at least not for a long time and we think it's because they're not quite right. They're they're pretty close. So this is a over here on the on the on the right corner here is this technique called RNA seq. It's very very sophisticated way of kind of fingerprinting cells as to what exactly they are. And um, the gist of it is if if you look at these bars here, the middle bars, red and blue, correlate with gene expression. That's a that's a true insulin cell, a normal insulin cell. 
And the one next to it on the right is the ones we've made. And you can see they're a little off, especially down low here with the, with the blue parts. And that we feel makes them kind of an imperfect insulin cell. They're a little bit more like a glucagon cell, barely, but they're nothing like the true glucagon cells, which are left in gray. So we think that's why they survive, at least for, for a fairly long time. All right, so uh, in order to, to go to humans, you can't just jump from mouse to human. So you gotta, you gotta show some feasibility in monkeys. So that was a, that was a tour de force, that took a while. So, so this is my dissection of a cad cadaver monkey. And what I'm trying to show here is that, here's that little opening I was talking about where the juices come out into the intestine, and I found it. And then I put a little catheter into it and I infused some dye just to show, yep, sure enough, here's the pancreas being filled up with the dye. So in theory, this should work similarly in monkeys. And um, so what we've done over the, over the last several years is worked out an infusion technique. It was, it was a bit of a pain because nobody had ever done anything like this in monkeys. Um, so what, we, what I'm showing you now is an is a x-ray image of a monkey undergoing surgery and I am preparing to infuse the virus into their pancreas. Right here is this little catheter that contains the virus when we infuse through. There's a clamp holding in place. Here's the liver, heart, lungs of the monkey. And you'll see as I start the, uh, the video uh, that, uh, that there's an infusion. So here's the tip of the catheter here. Let's see if we can get this to work. Yeah, okay, so here's the, here's the infusion. Sorry, you can see the, the virus coming out the tip of the catheter. It's filling up that duct, that tube in the pancreas. And as I continue to infuse more virus, it starts to spread throughout the, the pancreas and um, filling up all the pancreas and getting to those glucon cells and cells that it needs to get to to uh, do its work in terms of gene therapy. And um, it seems fairly simplistic, but man, I, the amount of time it took to get to this point was staggering. Um, anyway, so, and this is kind of looking, so here's the pancreas. Now, if we add some blue dye to the virus infusion, you can see how the pancreas is just ballooned up with all this virus solution. It's completely full. Um, so it's pretty effective. Anyway, so here's the, so when we, we don't have a model of juvenile diabetes in the monkey, it doesn't exist. So the best we can do is kind of that same, like we would give a toxin to kill their insulin cells. We did that to these monkeys. You can see that they're, here's a, these, these are a couple examples of monkeys. So they're, the, 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 the bars represent their insulin requirements. So it's very high. And then we do the viral infusion. And over time, it starts to kick in. And you can see how it, the, the insulin requirement goes down significantly. What we typically see is in the range of 75, 80, 85% reduction in their insulin requirement which is good, and we could probably go to human trials now, um, but I would prefer to optimize things a little more. And the other thing that's in our favor is that these monkeys have zero insulin cells. The drug just kills them all, there's none. Whereas humans with, with type one diabetes, they have, and especially type two, they have a fair number. Um, so it may not be so difficult to get them off of insulin uh, in, in, in humans rather than in monkeys. But either way, I, I, I do feel like we want to kind of optimize things a bit. Um, okay, so I mentioned this uh, company, Genprex. So they licensed this about a year and a half ago. That's important. They're not really helping now in terms of the monkey work and getting ready. But when we do transition to ramping up for human trials, they will be very helpful because they're, they're a gene therapy company. So they know the ropes in terms of helping us to move forward with uh, you know, the FDA and whatnot, and I think that'll be very helpful with their support. Um, okay, so the second topic, also gene therapy, is really, is really specific for type 1 or juvenile autoimmune diabetes, and it has to do with altering the way that the body attacks the, these, these insulin cells. And what's different about it is, is that we don't have to immunosuppress like you do for like, kids that need a transplant. Their, their body's immunosuppressed and they have infectious risks and all these things. This is only locally acting in the pancreas where the problem is related to attacking the, their own cells in the, in the, in the pancreas. Um, anyway, so the, the heart and soul of the autoimmune response is these special cells called macrophages. And um, they really are the kind of the, the culprit uh, in terms of what's happening in terms of this attack on the insulin cells. And um, there, there's two kind of shapes that they take on. One is M1, macrophage one where they're more inflammatory. They are really the bad actors in terms of autoimmunity. They're good actors in terms of preventing infection from bacteria and viruses and things like that, but they're bad in terms of causing autoimmunity. Um, the other one, M2, are more, um, you know, we, we rely on them more like when, you're, when you have to, if you get a cut and you have to heal your wound, they're very, they're very instrumental in those kind of regenerative or uh, important healing behaviors. Um, so, so 
the, the M1 ones are clearly associated with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And we wanted to use the gene therapy to actually convert these M1 macrophages into M2, specifically in the pancreas where all the autoimmune badness is happening that causes the diabetes. Um, anyway, so uh, we did. it's a similar kind of thing. It's a pancreatic infusion of a virus. Again, very similar. The only difference between the gene is different. And in this case, it's something called TIPE2, type 2, which uh, causes a switch. This is, this is kind of complicated. But basically, we can sort these cells and look at these. In this black box is all of the good macrophages in the, when we do the empty virus, the GFP. And here's the bad, the bad ones. Whereas if we do on the right here is where we do this TIPE2 virus. We see there's lots of these M2 ones and much less of the M1. So we, we have been able to do the conversion based on a viral infusion. And um, uh, this bar is just showing how most there's almost none there without without doing this infusion. There's a fair number when you do do it. And so then we said, well, okay, does that does that help? You know, what what happens when we do that? So this this graph is it's a little different than the other one. Well, this is showing us uh, what percentage of mice of these NOD autoimmune mice, you know, juvenile diabetes mice. What percentage of them don't have diabetes? So normally it goes down with time, as you would expect. And this is the this is both these curves are this is the empty virus in green or just an untouched NOD mouse in blue. But the but the red shows you how when you when you convert these M1 macrophage M2, there's a very very slowed uh, progression of the disease, but it's not completely gone. So obviously the question is what happens if you combine these two approaches? So what we did was um, we compared either nothing, which is, um, sorry, nothing, but just the empty virus, which is the blue, or the two one virus treatments. The green is the one I just talked about, this TIPE2, and they do eventually revert. They go back to having diabetes. Their blood sugar goes up. The gold is the first one I talked about, that PM virus, where they turn glucagon cells into uh, 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 insulin cells. And sure, they, they, go, they go sour after you know several months as well. Um, whereas if we do both, they really are preserved. Their, their blood sugar stays low for their whole life. Uh, these, these mice only live about a year. And this, this, this disease, the disease starts around 14 weeks of age. So they're, they're pushing their life expectancy here at the end. And I, one thing I always recall is that, you know, we talk about four months. Well, four months in a mouse. So, so in general, a lot of things that happen in mice um, physiologically, one week in a mouse tends to correlate to about a one year in humans. And to that point, the average age of onset of the uh, diabetes in these NOD mice is 14 weeks of age. The average, coincidentally, the average age of onset of juvenile diabetes in humans is 14 years. So we're sort of thinking that this could be a fairly, fairly prolonged uh, effect uh, in these humans. Um, all right. So what's what's the plan? So I mentioned about optimizing the virus. It's very complicated. There's there's potentially billions of different uh, coatings you can put on these viruses that may get them into the, the glucagon cells better and maybe the beta cells for the purpose of type 2 diabetes. But either way, there's also a lot of very a lot of um, a lot of variables and a lot of things we can we need to tinker with to optimize the the actual sequences of the genes that we're using and how they're they're uh, put how they're uh, turned on in the cells, things like that. Um, we need you know the Genprex is a, is a gene therapy company, but they haven't really done viruses previously. They've done more other non-virus forms of Gene therapy. So we, we would partner with a gene therapy, I mean a virus production company, um, which uh, to make this virus that's uh, called medical grade, so okay to give to humans, which is pretty straightforward. FDA approval, we anticipate about a year from start to finish, and then um, and then human trials really uh, moving forward. Uh, naturally, in a disease that occurs in both adults and children, we always start with the adults, but then I think in this setting, if it's working, it'll be very quick transition to, to children. All right, the last topic is this chemical pancreatectomy for chronic pancreatitis. So, so, um, so chronic pancreatitis is pretty common. There's about a quarter of a million people in the U.S. and several million uh, you know, worldwide that have this. It's related to alcohol. And um, basically, they, they have horrible pain. It's debilitating. And they have to take pain medicines. They're almost all addicted to opiates. Um, and the problem is there's really not a good treatment. So pain medicine, of course, helps. They're addicted, typically. Um, there are surgeries where you can try to cut out some of the bad pancreas and try to help that way. Doesn't really use your work. It's big surgery, not very good, not very nice surgery, and it doesn't work that well. 
Um, and then they get this really bad form of diabetes because, as I mentioned, most of the pancreas is these digestive cells, and that's what, that's what the problem is in this disease. But these poor insulin cells and the other hormone cells are just there, and they're, and they're killed, damaged or killed by innocent bystander kind of problem, all this, all this inflammation going on. So, and they get a really bad form of diabetes because normal, you know, the diabetes I've been talking about is the lack of insulin. Well, these folks lack all of the hormone cells in their pancreas. And an important function of some of the, like the glucon cell and other ones is to kind of be a counter regulatory where they bring their, so if you overdose on insulin, you can bring your blood sugar back up again. They don't have that. So the average diabetic takes their insulin, get a little too much, they go too low, but their body kind of kicks in a little bit. These people don't have that and they'll just die in their sleep when they go too much insulin, it's terrible. Um, there is an option for removing the entire pancreas. And, um, and then during that surgery, it's a huge surgery, absolutely huge. Um, you grind up the pancreas, get the insulin cells out and put them back into the patient. I mean, it's, it, it's, there, it's, it's applicable to a small percentage of these patients. And um, the big problem is it's a huge surgery and you lose a lot, if not most of the insulin cells are lost in the processing. So it's not ideal. So anyway, see, we were not really in any way intending to study this, but, but just a little story. So we were, we were, uh, we, I told you how we developed this technique for infusing into the pancreas, uh, in, in this case for viruses. Um, but for various reasons unrelated to this talk, there's a, a desire to get the breast cancer drug tamoxifen into the mouse to alter the way the genes are turned on, alter the, the, their uh, status genetically. And um, there was a guy in my lab, postdoc, who was doing this, uh, working with some mice where he needed to do this, but he knew about this technique to infuse into the pancreas. He's like, hey, wait a minute, why don't I infuse? I want to get a really high dose of tamoxifen into the pancreas. Why don't I use this technique but infuse the tamoxifen? instead of virus. There's only one problem. The uh, solution that you dissolve the uh, tamoxifen in is 100% ethanol. Well, that's really nasty stuff. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, Bacardi 151 is bad. This is a uh, hundred times worse. But um, so he's infusing 100% ethanol into the pancreas. I'm like, he tells me this. I'm like, buddy, you can't do that. They're just going to die. And he goes, no, they're fine. <laughs> I'm like what? They're fine. So anyway, so I so I quickly go with him to see these mice. And sure enough, they're they're running around the cage. They're fine. But um, so I sacrifice one of these mice, open it up, and um, to my amazement, now this is actually uh, since ethanol, we moved to acetic acid, like dilute vinegar. Vinegar is like five percent acetic acid. We're using one percent, but it's the same result. So here's the, what's supposed to be a pancreas. It's just clear. There's nothing there, and except there's all these little white dots. And those are all the islets. They're perfectly preserved and perfectly functional. And that's at one week. And then after eight weeks, there's some fatty replacement, which we see in humans also. It's perfectly harmless and normal. Uh, but you can still see all those islets are still there. And here's how the, the sections look on, under the microscope. You can see the blue and the red of the insulin and glucagon. But over here on a normal pancreas, you see all that green. That's, the, that's those digestive juices cells. They're all gone at, at one week, and they don't come back. So, uh, you know, the guy was like, oh, gosh, geez, I guess it didn't work. I'm like, no, no, this is amazing. You may have just cured chronic pancreatitis. It's incredible. Anyway, so, so that's, that's the good thing about having physician scientists as opposed to just PhDs alone in a lab. Anyway, so, um, and this is how they look. You've got these, these uh, hormone cell islets floating in fat. That's perfect. It's just what we want to see. These are fat cells shown under high power here that are surrounding it. It's very normal. And one curious thing we observed was that um, the, uh, when we remove these, these, enzyme cells, the glucose physiology, the, in, the insulin release and all that is better than normal. So this is what's called a glucose tolerance curve. So you have the, the blood sugars on the uh, axis. We give the, the animal, either a mouse or a monkey, we give them a bunch of glucose sugar and their sh blood sugar goes up, but then it starts coming back down because they make insulin and it brings it back down again. These, these ones where they don't have this other part of the pancreas are much, much better. It doesn't go up as high and they come down much quicker. And it's just, you never would have known this. And uh, we're actively studying why that might be in, you know, in terms of what is it about these other cells that called the exocrine pancreas that's bad for the hormone cells, the endocrine pancreas, and it's fascinating. Um, so we're actively pursuing that. Anyway, so um, what about this protection fact? Does it really protect these islets, the hormone cells? And the answer is yes. So here's a model where we do a PDL is a, is a type of way of causing chronic pancreatitis in mice. We do that, and they lose all their insulin cells, a lot of them. Whereas a normal mouse has this much insulin cells. And when we do this, the same model, but we add the acetic acid infusion, they're almost completely protected. They have all their, almost their complete um, complement of, uh, of uh, insulin cells. And same for how they function. They release insulin just properly. Uh, so there's no, no damage. It's not like they're not working properly. They're fine. 
And then of course, very importantly is the pain. So we've got some controls here. The first two columns on both these is, is controls. But this next one is what happens if you give them chronic pancreatitis. This is their pain response. It's much higher in both these assays. And then, but if we give them the chronic pancreatitis, but then do the acetic acid infusion, they're back down to normal. So we're very optimistic that this will actually take away the pain of these of these individuals suffering if we do this infusion um, for them. All right, and similar to the uh, gene therapy, we moved to monkeys, and the same thing happens in monkeys. So here's a pancreas where you've gotten rid of all the the, the enzyme producing cells you just left again with these little islets here all and this is a higher magnification you can see them all here and this is histology again it's very similar the, the islets are there and all the other tissue in the monkey is the pancreas is gone so that gives us optimism um and that's and this is the lab so um so we're moving forward with that with the fda uh, uh just want to give some uh you know uh, acknowledgments or our lab so this is mohammed saleh he's a pediatric endocrinologist he did it. He's doing a lot of the work with the uh, chemical pancreatectomy, and it's helped a lot with the, especially with the type two form of the uh, gene therapy um, with the PM virus. This is Jean Wei Zhao. He's been with me for ten years since he moved from Belgium. Um, he's really the leader of the gene therapy push. He was the first author on the initial paper uh, for for the uh, PM virus gene therapy uh, approach. He has a couple of people in his lab, and then I've got an assortment of expertise. I think one of the good things about our lab is we have. We have breadth. We have a lot of different areas of expertise that makes it very, uh, you know, very uh, broad um, in terms of our ability to troubleshoot and, and handle uh, unforeseen problems. Krishna Prasadam has been with me for over 20 years since I moved to Kansas City. Um, we have some monkey experts here: Jason, Jeremy, Kartik, and uh, Kartik and uh, and Ricky are kind of our monkey experts. We have mice experts like there's Maddie and Anu and Hannah. And not other kind of our mouse experts, and then we have virus experts. So here's Yuan Mei Ma, she's a virologist. Uh, Yan Wang, she's a, a molecular biologist specializing in virus technology, and then Tina uh, Ting Zhang, who is our um, virus production expert. So it's a good team. I think it works well together. Um, we have some collaborators. As far as that, Esni helps us with a lot of the uh, work with the chemical pancreatectomy, especially as it might apply to cancer, which we think it will. And then Jamie Solomon is our pain expert. And then lastly, my funding. And that is all. I would be happy to take any uh, questions as they arise. Okay, let's see what we have here. <coughs> Change my pointer here. All right, well, when do you think gene therapy of diabetes is available for patients? So, great question. Um, like I said, I mean, it could be available, you know, now or start working on it now. Um, I think a lot of it's going to depend on the next six to 12 months as to how we do with the virus in terms of actually getting monkeys off of um, insulin. I think that that... Uh, once that's happened, which could happen, you know, very soon. In fact, I, I bet it will happen very soon because of the, the strides we're making in terms of virus technology. Um, once that happens, then I, we will go straight to we'll go straight to the uh, FDA. I'll start preparing for uh, uh, and I, that process. I'm guessing will take about a year. We'll need to do some studies in uh, a special facility called a good laboratory practice facility, which will take a couple months, and then we'll have to partner with a company. So I think overall. I think if, if we started now, we'd probably be in human trials probably in 18 months, but just add however long it is from now to the point we feel comfortable through that 18 months, which could be as little as six months, or maybe it's a year, maybe it's a year and a half. That's probably the ballpark. Okay, let's see, next question. When do you decide to do surgery for pancreatitis? At what stage of the disease? Yes, yeah, so I am not a chronic pancreatitis surgeon for the most part. I'll, occasionally kids get it, I'm a pediatric surgeon. But when they when they do decide to do it, there's two situations. One is if they feel that they're candidates for this big operation where they take out the whole pancreas, grind it up, and put the insulin cells back in. That's called the total pancreatectomy with autoilot transplantation. That's done for patients that have severe pain but are deemed to be anatomically their pancreas is suitable and they're not yet diabetic. If they're diabetic, it's like forget it. It's not going to it's not going to work. They're already diabetic. Um, whereas there's other patients that have um, Focal areas of pancreatitis. That's not the whole pancreas. So if you just take out that focal area, they might be a candidate. And then lastly, there's people who have uh, 
diffuse disease throughout their pancreas, but their, the, the, the duct that I keep talking about is very dilated. And you can actually open that duct up and drain the fluid out directly into the intestine rather than having, having it to go out through the little opening that goes into the intestine normal. Um, let's see. Will there be clinical trials for diabetes gene therapy at CHP if yes, when? Well, hopefully. Um, there are clinical trials now that are related to immunotherapy, but um, from, what, from what I'm talking about, yes, we would definitely want to move to children. Um, like I said, it would start with adults, but it's going to be a, a study all based in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, like I said, I think that, you know, you start seeing effects in adults, it's going to be quick, and you're going to know soon. I think the jump to kids will be very fast because the pressure that'll be mounted on the FDA to, to uh, accelerate this and move into uh, different patient populations will be immense. So I imagine that um, you know, there'll be no stopping it, uh, once it once it gets rolling. Okay, let's see. How soon do you anticipate FDA approval and then human clinical trials? I think we sort of answered that. Basically, um, you know, like I said, a year, if we started now, it'll be a year and a half, and then add on top of that however long it takes till we feel comfortable moving forward with the virus cocktail that we've developed at the time, which I'm going to guess is in the range of minimum six months, you know, more realistically a year, year and a half, could be as long as three to four years, I doubt it. Um, how does the patient get an appointment at CHP for pancreatitis? That's through the GI clinic, so you definitely want to reach out to the gastroenterology clinic. They have specialists in pancreatitis, and um, that it's fairly easy to get seen there. There's, uh, uh, you know, you would mention the, the fact that there's pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, and they would have aligned you with one of the subspecialists within gastroenterology that is focused on that, uh, you know, on pancreatitis. Okay, so um, how would a family or patient find out about when a clinical trial is available? Should they ask their doctor? They, yes, but they, they could ask their doctor, I would recommend emailing me. And I have probably received at least 500, if not close to 1,000 emails from people based that have looked at stuff in the literature um, on, uh, on di I'm assuming this person's asking about diabetes, but um, if they're asking about chronic pancreatitis, then it's the same answer though. So uh, as you can email me, my email is G-I-T-T-E-S-G-K, get S G K at upmc.edu, and I keep a list of all, of the, all the folks that are interested and keep them updated when there's any major things that have happened uh, research-wise, and I will email you personally uh, to, to keep you updated. And certainly when we're ready for a clinical trial, I will be notified, because most of these people are basically reaching out to me because they want to be on the trial. Um, it's kind of, a, I, I didn't talk about it, but one of the guys in the lab um, moved here from Boston. He was a, he had done a lot of gene therapy work in Boston at a biotech company, and um, he went to school at Santa Barbara and then, and then moved to Boston. And then he saw some of our research being published and was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I want to work with this, this lab. So he contacted me and he moved to Pittsburgh from Boston, kind of uprooted himself. And he has juvenile diabetes and he wants to be the first patient to receive the therapy. So he will be the first one, I guarantee it once we get through that. Um, Okay, so I think there are no more questions, um, and this has been a great session. Thank you all for your interest and participation. And uh, please, I, I think I, I gave you my email, G-I-T-T-E-S-G-K at upmc.edu, so please feel free to email me and follow up if there's any other questions. And otherwise, thanks for your attention, and we are done.